Good afternoon, I'm Jim Thompson, Senior Writer with Monster. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this exclusive webinar hosted by Monster Intelligence. Today's webinar is entitled, Experience Engineering, Designing the Employee Experience. Lou Carbone from Experience Engineering will be presenting this afternoon this comprehensive webinar demonstrates why employers should proactively design employee experiences using as much rigor and resources as they are dedicating to the customer experience. Before we get started today, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation and a copy of the recording will be posted on hiring.monster.com within the next two to three business days. Please click on the resources tab and navigate to HR events to obtain your copy. All registered participants will also receive an email with a direct link to today's materials. Monster Intelligence helps HR professionals improve worker performance, retain top talent, and enhance recruiting strategies. We analyze and collect data from over 4 million unique job searches performed on Monster each day. We invite you to visit hiring.monster.com and read our in-depth reports and analysis. For our latest materials, click on the Resource Center tab when you visit the site. After the presentation, there'll be time for questions. Our meeting manager will help to facilitate the Q&A. Please feel free to type in your questions into the space during the event, and we'll make every effort to include them in today's Q&A. And if you're listening to today's presentation via telephone, you'll be placed on mute until the Q&A session begins. Now I would like to provide some background information on today's speaker, Lou Carbone. He is founder and chief experience officer at Experience Engineering. Recognized as the leader of the experience movement in the late 1980s, Lou delivers a thought-provoking program focused on positive customer experiences. Clients include Fortune 500 companies, top business schools, executive forums, sales conferences, associations, and educator conferences. His, lect his lecture at leading institutions such as the Harvard Business School, Columbia School of Business, Haas School of Business, the University of California at Berkeley, Texas A&M, Boston University, and many others. Lou has spent more than two decades developing experience management theory and practice in a broad range of industries, including travel, healthcare, retail, technology, financial services, manufacturing, and education. He is the founder and chief experience officer of Experience Engineering, a Minneapolis-based experience management firm. He teaches audience a system for managing experience clues that create customers who return and become company advocates. Please join me and welcome Lou Carbone. Lou, I'd like to turn the webinar over to you. Jim, thank you very much, and uh, I'm so pleased and thank all of the attendees uh, who are attending this webinar today uh, for their attention. And I'm very excited uh, about the opportunity uh, over 20 years ago creating experience engineering. Uh, there's been so much that has taken place in the world of experience and thinking about value creation experientially. And the company was actually founded as experience engineering rather than customer experience engineering to really be able to help organizations engineer any experience, whether it's an employee experience or a customer experience. And I'm pleased to say that, uh, that more and more organizations seem to be much more interested in what I would call intentional design of, of uh, employee experiences. So what I would like to cover today is a, a couple of key things with you and share some insights of having worked in the world of experience management for more than two decades. And uh, the, the first is this general introduction and then what I'd like to go over is five absolutes of experience management. Literally, what is it that's creating um, tools in the 21st century to think about experience management quite differently than we have in the past. And then I'd like to really get into some specifics about steps that can be taken to begin managing employee experiences with greater rigor and with greater
greater intentional design of those experiences. And the opening premise that's critical is that you cannot not have an experience, that uh, there's no way you can work for an organization, even an independent contractor, without having an experience. And how that experience is managed, whether it's a very haphazard experience, uh, whether it's very intentionally designed to create a specific outcome that leads to uh, a much more uh, engaged employee, an employee that I like to say is invested, uh, and an employee that is less likely to churn. Uh, so I think that the whole concept of how managed for haphazard an experience is in an organization and an employee experience in particular is, is critical. So what I'd like to do is actually start out with a poll. And that first question that is so critical is, does your organization focus on managing employee experiences with as much rigor as they are managing customer experiences and the concern they have for managing those experiences. The question, the responses are with greater rigor, more rigor, as much rigor, less rigor, or no rigor at all. And if you would kindly respond to those questions, that would be great. And I think we see such a, um, uh, an intense desire uh, in many organizations to understand employees. And I hear so much about employee engagement, and uh, we hear a lot about customer, and customer engagement today. And I just wonder how dedicated resources are, methodologies, even an appreciation for the intentional design and execution of those experience designs in, in an organization. So I think that as we think about it, where does our organization or your particular organization fit in terms of the intensity of managing those experiences? And as I uh, look at the uh, results that have come back, it's somewhat disappointing that over 61% of you feel that if less rigor uh, is being applied to the employee experience than the customer experience. And the next category up is as a much, is at 23%, 4% uh, at greater rigor, and uh, more rigor at 5%. And then there's actually 7% that say that there's no rigor applied at all. And I think that it really points out um, both what happens on a first day, what happens in interviewing processes, um, what happens as employees are, are employed in a company. I know of companies that don't even um, really adhere to uh, properly, even reviewing people on a regular basis, and what the review experience is, is like. And this is rather shocking, because for more than 30 years almost, there's been a construct around and research that's been done, which is referred to as the service profit chain. And it's work that was done by Jim Haskett, Gary Loveman, uh, and uh, Len Flesinger and Earl Sasser at the Harvard Business School. And in fact, um, the, uh, Gary Lovinger is the head of Harris uh, Entertainment. He's the CEO there now. And this understanding of the relationship between creating extraordinary experiences for employees literally impacts and affects the customer experience. And that where great employee experiences exist, better customer experiences exist, and where both of these components are present, organizations perform better financially. 
And in fact, it's not just the financial performance, but it's even reducing turnover by as much as 87% in, in studies that have been done by the Leadership Council. And those engaged organizations grew profits three times faster than their competitors, and they actually improved employee performance by as much as 20%. So it's sort of an ostrich syndrome to a degree to kind of bury our heads in the ground and not think that there's great possibility and potential in what we can derive by creating more robust rigor and greater intentional experience design for employees. So there are five basic questions that I would ask that uh, you think about that are related to managing that employee experience. Uh, first is how deep are your insights into the employee experience, the brand, the values, and how are those evidenced? Have you desired, have you actually defined how employees desire feeling? You know, the, the it's how they feel about themselves and the experience that they have working for an organization is what they reflect on how they think about the company. Have you mapped out the employee experience from a psychological perspective? What are employees feeling and what are the experiences as we design them to cause them to feel the way they want to feel and desire feeling? Do you have a comprehensive and intentional experience design? And how consistently is that experience design executed? So these are real critical questions that are at the foundation of moving employee experience design and management into the 21st century. So my next question and next polling question is, how intentional is the design of employee experience in your organization? Very intentional, somewhat intentional, moderately intentional, not intentional at all, or uncertain as to how intentional it is. This question is distinguished from the first question, which was resources or basically um, the comparison to customer experience. But now when you look at that experience itself, the employee experience, in and of itself, how would you rate it on the intentionality of arriving at a specific emotional outcome that engages that employee? Is it very intentional, somewhat intentional, moderately intentional, not intentional at all, or uncertain in terms of how intentional that is. As we think about, uh, even thinking about your own first day on the job, your own last review, uh, looking at it not from an HR perspective even, but from being an employee yourself in your organization, how would your employees respond to this question? And I see that it's moderately intentional is the leading category with 38%, somewhat intentional with 27%, very intentional with 9% of the organizations, and not intentional at all, 18%, and uncertain at 8%. And again, this is a, a cause for concern. I would believe that with employees being the most critical resource, and especially in service businesses, employees being the most critical resource, everything should be somewhere in that top box, top two box category. And I, I just feel that we've underestimated the opportunity of what we've learned about intentional experience design and the tools available in the 21st century that it, it's considerably under leveraged. And what are those tools? What are the perspectives that are driving experience management in the 21st century? And there are five basic absolutes in looking at experience management today and the power that it represents going into 
the future. That first is that we need to move from the world of making and selling. Most of what we've learned in business schools is built around a model that came out of the industrial age, and we need to move to sensing and responding. That is absolutely a critical shift that has to take place, that organizations need to be more sensing and agile to respond. Understanding and leveraging the role of unconscious thought, the need to think employee back versus company out, thinking that it's about the emotional bond and the rational bond that's provided, but thinking about it from an employee's perspective back versus what we want to impose on employees. The next is becoming clue conscious, which is what are the clues and signals that are embedded in the experiences that we have? And then developing rigorous systems that develop, design, and then manage those clues to take place in the experiences. So let me talk about that first point in the five absolutes, moving from making and selling to sensing and responding. And in the past, if you look at the heritage that we had out of this industrial age, which was very siloed, collaboration was minimal, even conversation on assembly lines at Ford were forbidden between one individual and another. So this changing world and the ability for employees to even post things in social media about what it's like to work somewhere is so different than the world that we grew up in and what we were taught in business schools and the way we structure organizations. The need to really understand that decentralized organizations, the ability for command and control organizations, these things are disappearing and accountabilities become more important, collaboration becomes more important, and the values around those things, and understanding the emotional dynamics of working for a company, and the need to sense those things and be able to respond appropriately with agility becomes really important. The next area, which is understanding and leveraging the role of unconscious thought is exciting and powerful, that we are not just rational beings. Most of what we experience, we actually create intellectual alibis for those emotional feelings and the decisions that we make. And we've learned more about neuroscience and psychology in the last decade than in the entire history of those disciplines. Over the years, I've been very fortunate to work with a colleague, Jerry Zaltman, at the Harvard Business School, a professor emeritus there, who developed the laboratory of the consumer mind. And in early studies, even studies we did uh, with uh, people undergoing PET scans uh, to see what parts of their brain were actually ignited in thought process around experiences, what we learned is that the tangible attributes of a product or service actually have less influence than the subconscious and sensory emotional elements that are derived from the total experience. So ultimately, the value we receive either as a consumer or as an employee is the emotional elements that we derive from the experiences that we have. And embedded in these experiences are clues. Those clues affect our emotions. Those emotions shape our attitudes. And ultimately, those attitudes drive our behavior. And it's a question of cause and effect. Clues are the cause. The effect is the behavior. So understanding brain science and the idea that limbic pathways to the brain, which are actually unconscious thoughts, really drive the way we interpret information and the ability to link these neurons together over and over create deep impressions in the brain. And the more deep those impressions are, the more that these characteristics of an experience are embedded and engraved in the thought patterns of employees or of consumers build this strong bond. So understanding that science and knowing that 95% of what we process in an experience 
actually takes place at an unconscious level. And often we'll ask in surveys for people's opinion about experiences that they have. Yet there are ways to probe unconscious thought that bring us down to universal schemes, bring us to common archetypes and unique scripts, and that isn't what you derive in surveys. Surveys are opinions. What I would rather know about people is what they think and how they think become, um, what I'd rather know is how they think, how they formulate their thoughts. What are the constructs in the way they view those frameworks? These unconscious frameworks are around us. Our brains work this way every day. If you've ever purchased a paper out of a, a vending machine, 78% of the people will not take the top paper unconsciously. There are probably some of you out there that are not top paper takers. So I'm going to do one other experiment on how people do clue math, how our brains take information and data, sort it, and create meaning out of all of the noise that we see and how remarkable that part of our brain is that makes sense out of noise. I'm going to put up a picture of a young girl with a red dot on her nose. I would like you to focus just on the red dot. And then I'm going to switch to a blank white screen and when I do that, I would like you to blink repeatedly and quickly. So if you stare at the red dot on her nose, just look at the red dot. Just stare at the red dot. And in a moment, I'm going to switch to a white screen. And I'd like you to blink rapidly. Ready? As you look at your computer screen, you probably saw the picture became a color picture. And the impression moves off to the upper right-hand corner. It's amazing the way our brains fill in the lines and create these sensations. The same way that visual sensation is created is the way we formulate emotion. It's the stimuli, the effect of the stimuli, and the processing against frameworks that exist in our brains. So the need to think uh, employee back becomes critical, that there's an emotional and rational bond, and that there are emotional needs that we all have that become this basic filter by which we look at the experiences we have and process the information in the experiences that we have. So that emotional piece is what we then create behavioral and intellectual alibis around. An organization that I have the greatest respect for, I actually went through their training program uh, before they opened a new store, uh, is the Container Store. And in 2013, the Container Store celebrated its 14th year on Fortune Magazine's 100 Best Companies to Work For list. They believe that the employee is the number one stakeholder. They even state that mantra, putting employees first, that mantra is on their website. They put people through 260 hours of training in the first year. 170 hours of additional training creates equipped and engaged employees. They believe in empowering employees and creating emotional engagement, and in turn, that creates engaged customers. And they don't have an HR department. I went through that training. I was amazed that at the end of my training, I was mourning the fact that I wasn't a real employee and wasn't going to be able to work in the store. I was depressed for a couple of days. I wanted to be part of that company and work in that store so badly. I feel a great affinity to that organization. 
And Kip Pendell, the one of the co-founders and CEO and all of the senior management there, are absolutely amazing. And they say, give them more than enough experience. The average retail employee in America is trained for eight hours. The container store trains new full-time employees over 250 hours. And that presence of how important their employees are and Kip says, take care of employees better than anyone else, and they will take care of customers better than anyone else. And what's fascinating is that you actually can look at this organization and see that they clearly recognize that the, there's a direct connection between the capability, energy, and passion of employees and the success of a business. And if you were to go out and look at blogs and listings and comments that are made in social media on working there. It's amazing. By far, this is the happiest place I've ever worked. From the moment I walk in the door, I feel a positive, productive energy. My workday zooms as I assist customers with organizing dilemmas, designing our fabulous space solution. I've worked in different retail environments before, and I can honestly say that working for the container store is almost a dream come true, a visual sales member at the Houston, Texas store. Unbelievable. So when we look at that, that, that level of engagement, I believe that when you really can architect an experience, it goes beyond, beyond engaged employees. It's invested employees. There's a spirit of volunteerism that I notice in organizations that have phenomenal customer experiences, and that volunteerism is on behalf of the employees who do more than it takes to just keep your job. They volunteer. They're investing in their job, and that is huge. The next element is becoming clue conscious. This idea of clues, what are the signals the noise in an experience that we make meaning out of. And employees consciously and unconsciously filter a barrage of clues. They organize them into a set of impressions. Some of those impressions are rational, some are emotional. And ultimately the decision making is made through an emotional framework that intellectual alibis are created from. Those clues are the taken in through the only way we can take information in, and that's what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, and what we feel. In experiences, there are functional clues that deal with the functionality. There are mechanic clues that deal with emotional elements around the stimuli, the sights, the smells, the sounds, the texture, the lighting and where I work, the, the, uh, my approach to the building in the morning, the doors I have to walk through, security, all of those elements. And then there are humanic clues that are associated with people, choice of words, tone of voice, level of enthusiasm, appearance, body language, other employees. So let's look at clues. Some clues are, are very subtle. In the FedEx logo, there's actually a clue embedded in that FedEx logo that's very directed, very, very purposeful in the way that that is created. Not all clues are created equally. There are some clues that organizations send out that are very direct in advertising messages. Here's a clue on a hotel room bed when I checked into a hotel, and on the bed, is Inspector McGruff. Take a bite out of crime. Very different feeling than this room, where the clue embedded in my experience here is Bill, make breakfast for me on the bet that I'll be alive the next morning if I fill out the card. That's a hell of a lot more reassuring than going to bed with Inspector McGruff. Toilet paper. It is absolutely astounding, the power of communication in terms of signals that toilet paper represents. You see, we've become accustomed to clues. 
This is a hotel room that I checked into, and here is the absence of a clue that I've become accustomed to. That clue being the toilet paper triangle. When I checked into that room without the toilet paper triangle, I'm wondering who was here before I got here? Did they actually forget to clean the room? Now, what's so powerful is that the toilet paper triangle, you know, businesses are quite competitive and quite imaginative and marketing in many businesses can look at a clue that someone else has actually instituted or created and they would try to improve on it. So if one triangle is good, someone thought two would be better than one. Someone else thought, wow, if the competitors are doing two, I could do three. Or here, I could actually have an accident before I get to the bathroom. So the question of whether clues are made, basically created from the recipient's perspective or from the customer's perspective or employee's perspective is a huge gap that creativity for the sake of creativity without a purpose or an end frame is not that effective. Then ultimately the ability to develop rigorous systems to develop and manage clues. What are the clues like in an experience where they're just random, a bunch of ideas that aren't tied together to what we call an emotional end frame, an experience motif. What is it that we want people to feel, that invisible connection that becomes the linkage between all of the clues to create an effect for the employee? And that is about systems thinking. If I know what the effect is, how do I pull that effect through and how do the pieces fit together to create that? So at this point, I'd like to ask another question. As we talked about intentional design, as we talked about the importance of employee experience related to customer experience, I'd like to poll you one more time and ask, what is the reason, what stands in the way of an organization optimally and intentionally designing and managing employee experiences for the organization? Is it a lack of leadership buy-in? Is it a lack of people resources? Is it a lack of monetary resources? Is it the feeling that employees are complacent? Or is it just viewed as unimportant? Or are there other things that stand in the way? And I really appreciate your consideration on this as I think about, and we are doing more and more work in trying to awaken the potential of intentional design and intentional employee experiences, because what could be greater than creating great emotional meaning for people in the work they do and the contribution that they make in a world that doesn't seem to understand how to communicate that today. And it's more important today than ever, ever before. I find that this examination of what is it that stands in the way in an organization thinking about employee experience the same way, the same framework, with the same perception of intentional value. And the results are in, and it basically says that 40% feel it's the lack of leadership buy-in. That's quite sad. And that this attachment, having leaders understand this potential is so critical. The next is uh, basically the idea that employees are complacent. And then at 14% is the lack of people resources. And then we come to the lack of uh, monetary and about 7% fell into other. Well, I am seeing more and more work we've done with organizations recently, articles in the Wall Street Journal that talk about the first day of employment. We've just done a, a 
beautiful program with John Deere on the global first day experience. What is it like? What will people feel? I think it's becoming more and more important, and I think it's really critical to begin getting these messages to leadership. It is so valuable in the results that I'm seeing with companies in reducing churn, impacting the customer experience, and increasing profitability. Having invested employees, not just engaged, invested. And it's quite powerful. So as you go about managing employee experiences, we know that we can systematically and intentionally design experiences to create these emotional bonds. And those five easy steps are literally exploring and identifying these deep insights, these emotional insights, defining that emotional end frame that is unconscious, conducting journey mapping, and I say journey mapping, but with a twist of the psychological pathways. What are our employees feeling? What is a new employee feeling before they even show up for the job? What's the anxiety over? What do they desire feeling? And then how do we intentionally design that experience? And then how do we implement that in an organization and making sure that it's implemented? And I hope that more and more organizations begin to do that. So when we look at identifying those deep insights, it's understanding the emotional underpinnings of the employee's current experience, identifying the desired experience, and understanding the difference between a job role and how it affects the experience versus the function of a job. Defining that emotional end frame, we call this an experience motif. Identify that motif. What is it that people want to feel? And based on those deep, deep insights, core values and brand positionings, developing a motif statement that says, at blank, we want employees to feel blank, blank, and blank. And as you design that experience, it passes that filter. Conducting this journey mapping, this psychological mapping, we call them psychological pathways, and I've actually referred to them as psychopaths. Not a very popular way of looking at an, an experience, but if you just do journey mapping, which is process mapping, you haven't touched the experience. You're improving a process. Creating an experience is dealing with the psychological feeling that someone has in the experience. Creating that intentional experience design. What are the clues that are embedded, humanic and mechanic, in order to achieve that desired emotional end frame? And lastly, implementing it. How do we deploy it? How do we educate people, communicate it? How do we measure it and understand and drive the behaviors? The ongoing support so that it's sustainable and continuous improvement and continuous adaptation because of the need to sense and respond. So with that, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share what I believe represents some of the greatest potential for economic return in organizations in the 21st century. Thank you. I'll turn that back over to you, Jim, then, for questions and, and to Kim. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank Lou uh, for sharing his insights with us today. At this time, I'll turn over the webinar to our uh, meeting manager, who will help support the question and answer session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will then be accessed from the conference to obtain information. If your question has been answered and you'd like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. And if you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. One moment, please, for our first question. And while we're waiting uh, on your end for questions to spool in, I have some questions on my side, and I'll, I'll go ahead and jump right in, Lou. Uh, first, uh, first question. Could you explain a bit about uh, how you would go about correlating 
the employee experience with the customer value. Yes, and uh, what I would refer you to is um, the work that Sasser and Haskett and the group did up at the Harvard Business School. There's been extensive research and study, case studies, where the relationship between employee experience and customer experience uh, are evidenced. And I believe that there have been studies done um, in organizations, it's all the way from looking at salespeople in the field and business to business even, and looking at their sales performance and looking at a gauge of uh, what their emotional engagement level is. So the first part of it is to look at a pool of people and every organization will have a smattering of people who are underperformers, overperformers, et cetera, et cetera, especially in sales or uh, call centers in any, any environment virtually, and begin to look at the emotional level of connection and the person's performance. And where you have direct connection to dollars and cents is really very, very exciting when you can look at data like that that's very easily accessible. Uh, but fashioning it, and we've fashioned studies in numerous organizations to look at those, and it, it's very customized to a great degree because it depends on, on the type of organization and the direct correlation uh, to sales and how sales come in. And also, there's a cultural question within organizations when you're looking for leadership buy-in uh, in terms of how research is done and presented. They're a very analytical organization and how you take this information and create an experience for leadership to see those correlations is, is important. It's almost as important as the data itself. Excellent, well thanks very much for that. I have an additional question coming through uh, via text and this one is coming from Jill. Uh, how does a small company, uh, looks like about seven folks, overcome the lack of monetary resources to devote uh, to employees? Jill, it isn't about money, which is really interesting. Um, I worked with an organization in the UK that was very, very small. And what I learned from that gentleman uh, that grew that company into almost uh, 800 at-home employees that, that work at home, it's a travel agency, and he continually said to me, it's not about the money. And that starts with the owner of an organization. And in a small organization, which is what my, my own firm is, is not a massively huge organization, uh, it really starts from examination of conscious and conscience and saying, what is it that people desire feeling? What am I doing to enhance that? And uh, it's tough in a small business to take the time out to do that. But I would recommend to almost any small business owner to dedicate a half-day holiday for yourself once a quarter to ask yourself, it's almost like an examination of conscience, if this is what my employees desire feeling, what am I doing, what signals, what clues are they getting? Uh, I just think that it, it's making it um, intrinsic. It makes it it's something that becomes part of the business. Outstanding. Uh, I have a, the next question is coming in from, I believe it's Shailen, and uh, she's asking uh, what tips uh, you could share with us on creating uh, the employee experience during the actual interview process. Extraordinary. Even the way that seats are positioned, you wouldn't believe the, um, the clues <laughs> on, on how intimidating that interview can be. I think that even that interview process, acknowledging that you've got someone's resume, I can't get over how little we actually, uh, you know, people put hours into that stuff and it ends up in a black hole. No one ever makes a comment or gives anyone feedback on, on what a resume is like and whether it's well prepared or poorly prepared. Uh, feedback, I mean, that just that basic feedback creates a sense that there's open communication uh, and that the interview process is uh, in many organizations, feels like an interrogation. And what happens is you've got multiple interviews. So if it's not just one interviewer, you're going to have maybe three or four. 
how do you set the guidelines and embed the clues in that series of interviews that allow people to get a sense of the heart and soul of, of what the organization is about and how it delivers those to its people. So the tips are really to, to actually sit on the other side and, and go through that interview process. And what are you feeling? Ask yourself constantly, what am I feeling and why? And if it's too small an organization <laughs> to, to actually be interviewed yourself, just ask someone to come into the environment that an interview is done in and sit on the other side and ask them to have them ask you questions. What are the things you're looking at? What are the things on the wall? What's the carpet like? What's the lighting like? All critical aspects of the experience. Excellent, thank you, Lou. Our next question uh, is coming from Evelyn, uh, and she's uh, asked if you could make uh, some recommendations on persuading management to get on board with the creation of a positive employee experience. Is there uh, a way to help them or encourage them to make this, uh, this type of action uh, a priority? Yeah, I, I think it's a two by four across. The, no, <laughs> there's there's such a big opportunity to wake companies up. Twenty years ago, when I first started talking about customer experience, it was like I was smoking the drapes. Today, customer experience is on the lips of people everywhere, all across the globe. Everybody can make a difference by helping to educate senior leadership. What can I do to bring them around? What can I do to help them understand this? What experiences can I bring to them? Uh, there's more and more data becoming available, and this is actually becoming one of my big crusades as we've made such an impact over the years of bringing customer experience to the forefront. And I believe that this idea of invested employees that have something to gain by the success of the company emotionally, not financially. In some cases, that's true. But it's being invested, that spirit of volunteerism and what it pays off. Uh, the container store will actually pay three times what other retailers pay their frontline employees because that's how much more productive they are. There's also a group called Conscious Capitalism that uh, – Kip Trend, uh, uh, at, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the container store, along with the founder of Whole Foods, they were college roommates, and have reconnected and created a group of companies that are committed to having people find more meaning in the work that they do. Excellent. Thanks for that, Lou. And uh, at, at this point, I'd like to uh, check in with Kim to see if she's gotten some questions on her end that she'd like to uh, put forth. There are no questions at this time. However, again, ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, to register for any questions or comments, please press 1-4 on your telephone keypad. All right. Well, I'll, I'll continue along with the questions coming in on our side. Uh, this, this last one, this next one, comes uh, it kind of ties into the one you just answered, but uh, I'd like to pose it to you as well. Uh, is there a way to uh, overcome leadership or persuade leadership in a kind of command and control management style if, if you're feeling a little bit intimidated about the way management is, is uh, behaving? Is there a tactic specifically for that style of, of organization or culture? Yes. And uh, what's odd is that um, the once Someone told me that the methodologies that we have developed for customer experience management are transformational. And what becomes so powerful is that it's Trojan horse transformation. That often you can go in and try to talk to a senior executive that's very command and control and say, uh, you know, well, we need to change, we need to change, we need to change. But how you bring them about to basic thinking that themselves is critical. And it's a journey. It isn't a silver bullet. It's bringing enlightenment to them. And as they go through this process of understanding uh, this from a different perspective, 
that transformation takes place. I don't know how many times I've had a client say, my life has been changed in the way that I see how value is created both for our customers and our employees because of the journey I've been on and the learning that I've had. And it's just providing new frameworks and new clues to help them put the picture together. And it's just like that unconscious um, set of frameworks that cause us to see that photo in color. What are the clues that are embedded in their journey that help bring that thought process together through the new frameworks and see the light? see the picture in color versus black and white. And uh, it's, it's really powerful when it happens. Um, and, and this command and control environment, which is what the industrial age was, was built around, you'll find that as we progress into the 21st century, those people who are so locked into that thought process will end up becoming less and less successful and have more and more difficulty surviving as younger generations continue to enter the workforce that have different frameworks. Excellent, thanks very much. Uh, next question, uh, this kind of circles back around to earlier in the presentation. Uh, is there a risk that the employee desired experience uh, may not calibrate with company goals or organizational values? Is there and if ever a time when those are, are in conflict enough where things just aren't feasible? I think that uh, it depends on values and a real critical part of the work uh, is understanding values and brand. And I said that in addition to the emotional frameworks um, and that the values of an organization and in any organization, it's the values that ultimately end up uh, being a real critical piece of fit. So that's sort of the, the first step in terms of, you know, if, if an organization is uh, uh, made off or something like that, and, you know, you, that's a tough environment when your values don't sync up with what the organization is doing. Uh, but I think it's a much rarer thing. I, I, I haven't seen it happen that often. Uh, I think it's a much less uh, a problem in that, that environment. More often than not, what's amazing is that they are both very much in sync. And often, the other thing that's very interesting is when we find that emotional end frame for customers, often it's the very same thing that employees desire. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Kim, I thought I'd just uh, check in with you once more as our uh, questions queue up. Do you have any uh, coming in on your end? There are no questions at this time. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I think we've got time for, for one more here. I've got uh, one coming in from Kerry. Uh, and this speaks to employee compensation versus, uh, versus experience. So uh, in a nutshell, the question is if, if we have employees that uh, are paid a significantly amount lower but receiving a very positive employee experience, how, how does one compete? when down the road another company that may not offer a positive experience for employees uh, has a significantly higher dollar per hour uh, compensation packages. Yeah, how how sure do you... Uh, great, great question. Um, and I, I often am asked that question. And examples that I've seen over the years, uh, and Dan Pink has, has written some incredible stuff around this as, as um, Marcus Buckingham uh, has also, on the meaning that we get out of the work and the, the willingness to make that investment. And uh, two examples come to mind that are very prevalent, uh, both of the organizations I've had experience with. Uh, the first is Disney, and that for Many, many decades, over the years, Disney has not paid at the top scale. Yet, people die to work there. And it is for the meaning, the value that they derive from that experience, and the 
uh, ability to put it on a resume, the, the credentials that come with it. The other area where the spirit of volunteerism is so powerful is an organization in Rochester, Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic. They're in Rochester, Jacksonville, Florida, and Scottsdale, Arizona. And Len Berry, who is a professor at Texas A&M, wrote a book called Business Lessons from the Mayo Clinic, a very worthwhile read. And it's there that Len began to talk about the spirit of volunteerism. What is it in an organization that causes people to go above and beyond what their pay is to volunteer, to be invested? And if you think about the Mayo Clinic, it's one of the big standout features is built around teamwork and built around the fact that the physicians there are salaried, which was when it was a, an idea and a concept that cr was created many, many years ago. It was unheard of. And this idea of a, of a, a salary and a cap and not this, you know, a, a doctor being in it to make as much money and do as many procedures as they could do. Uh, and what the Mayo Clinic ends up being is a place where if you go for an exam, the doctors feel so fulfilled because they're able to do what they got into medicine to do. And it's one of the only places I know of where if you're in an exam with a doctor, you're looking at your watch saying, I'm going to be late for my next appointment here at the clinic because he's spending so much time with me. It's the passion for what we get back, for what we give in a business, the spirit of volunteerism. And it is extraordinarily powerful. And that's why I think it goes beyond engagement. What is it in the jobs that we have and how do we allow people to be willing to invest more of themselves because of what they get back emotionally from the work that they do? Excellent. Very, very good. Thanks for that question. Um, we're going to wrap up uh, the Q&A session now, and uh, we will forward uh, questions along uh, that haven't been addressed this afternoon. So at this point, uh, I'd like to thank Lou uh, for sharing his expertise today. Uh, this does conclude our webinar. A recording of this event, as well as the presentation materials, will be available shortly on our hiring site, hiring.monster.com. Please look under the Resources tab for that information. And thank you for joining us, and have a great day.